the wolf, and the seven little goats. Once upon a time, there lived an old mother goat in a pretty little cottage. She had seven little adorable kids. A big, bad, cunning wolf also resided next to their cottage, who always craved to have them all for his meal. One day, Mother Goat had to go and get food for the kids. So she told them, Listen carefully, my dear children. I'm going into the woods to get some delicious food for you all. Do not open the door while I am away. If the big bad wolf comes into our cottage, he will eat you all up. The old scoundrel always disguises himself. But you won't have any trouble recognizing him because he has a gruff voice, black feet, and pointed nails. Dear mother, we will be very careful not to let the big bad wolf in. Don't worry about us. We will be quite safe. So the mother goat went on her way. Not long when there came a loud knock at the door. Dear little children, please open the door. I am your mother who sings you lore. One of the kid threw the red chili powder from the window above the door. The big bad wolf was burning through and through. He could not open his eyes and he was running here and there for help. We will not open the door. Our mother's voice is soft and gentle as honey. Your voice is rough and gruff. You are a big bad wolf. Big bad wolf was disappointed by listening to the comment and he ran to find a honeycomb. He wanted to eat honey as he knew honey will make his voice soft and sweet. Soon he found honeycomb hanging on a tree. To get the honeycomb for himself, he pelted a stone towards it. The bees flew and attacked him. To save himself, he jumped into the pond nearby. After some time, when the bees were gone, he ate all the honey and ran back towards Goat's cottage and knocked on the door again. Sweet little children, now you open the door. I am your sweet mother, just be assured. If you are our mother, put your foot in the door crack so that we can see it. The wolf did as the little goats instructed him to do. He slid his foot from the crack below. The kids saw that the foot is back and one of them hit it hard with a big hammer. Big Bad Wolf cried out loud with the pain. Nope, you are not our mother. We will not open the door. Our mother's feet are white and yours are black. Go away, you nasty Big Bad Wolf. This time, the Big Bad Wolf got really frustrated. Now, he again ran towards the village to meet Mr. Miller. As he entered the village, villagers threw stones at him to shoo him away. But he managed to reach Mr. Miller even after getting hurt. Grr, listen, Mr. Miller, put some flour on my feet. Else in an instant, you'll see I'll be chewing your boots. The miller was so afraid of the wolf that he did as he was told. Then the big bad wolf went to the goat's cottage again. He knocked on the door and said, Dear little children, now you must open the door. I am your mother. Now don't be naughty anymore. Show us your foot. The wolf was afraid this time to put his white foot into the door crack. The shivering foot came through the door, and the kids noticed the pointed, sharp nails. So one of them gets the mousetrap, and soon the wolf seems to be crying in pain with the mousetrap stuck on his foot. No, you are not our mother. You have nails as pointed as the 
big bad wolf. Just go away from here. The wolf was very angry this time and could not bear the fact that the kids are smarter than him. He wanted to have them for his meal at any cost now. So he again went back to his own cottage, grabbed the nail filing kit, and cut off his nails. He then filled them properly so that they are not pointed or sharper anymore. He again rushed back to the goat's cottage, knocked on the door, and said, You naughty, naughty children, just open the door, else be ready. This time I will spank you, sure. Show us your feet, mother. The wolf slides his feet from the crack below. He was extremely scared of not knowing what is to come next. The foot was white. There were no pointed nails on it, and the voice was also as sweet as their mother. So the kids thought this time this was really their mother, and they opened the door. Welcome, mother. You are home at last. The big bad wolf entered, and all little kids ran to hide themselves. First kid hides under the table. The second one went to hide under the bed. Third one gets inside the oven. Fourth kid hides under the pot. Fifth kid climbs into the cupboard. The sixth one ran under the wash tub. And the last one hides in the tall clock. The wolf hunts each one of them and ate them all, except the youngest, who was in the clock. Then the wolf went out and lay down on the green grass. Tired and full, he was sleepy. Soon he was fast asleep. When the mother goat came home from the woods, she found the door was open and no one at home. Oh, my door is open. What happened here? The tables and chairs were not in their place. The wash tub was broken, and the bed was tipped over. Where are my dear children? Dear mother, I'm here in the tall clock. The mother goat helped the little goat out. Soon, she found out how the wolf had eaten her dear children. Then she went out of the hut. And there on the grass was the wolf asleep. As the goat looked at the big bad wolf, she saw something moving in his belly. Ah, oh, my poor children are still alive. I should get them back. So she sent the little kid into the house for a pair of scissors and a needle and some thread. She quickly slit open his tummy with the scissors, and one of the kids stuck out his head. Then another one popped out, until she pulled all six children out of wolf tummy. Go and bring me some large stones from the brook. Yes, mother. Let's hurry up. The seven little kids ran off to the brook and soon came back with seven large stones. They put these stones inside the wicked old wolf. I'll sew the wolf gently and quietly so he doesn't wake up. Soon, she sewed wolf's tummy. After a while, when at last the big bad wolf woke up, the big stones inside him made him feel very heavy. What's that rumbling down below? Feels to me like vertigo. It must be all those little bones, but now they're heavy, just like stones. So he walked down to the brook to drink some water. But as soon as he finished drinking, the stones, which were very heavy, made him fell into the deep water, and he was drowned. The End Wizard of Oz Many years ago, in a place called Lawrence, there lived a little girl whose name was Dorothy. She lived with her Aunt Em and Uncle Henry on their farm. She had a dog named Toto. One day, she noticed strange weather. The clouds were dense and thundering loud. 
Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky, too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes when she heard a loud wail of the wind, and she ran towards the door to see if the storm was about to come. Suddenly, Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and ran towards the cyclone, and she, too, ran behind to catch him. After a while, finally, Toto hid under the hot-aired balloon, which halts beyond the farm. There, she met a very interesting person. He was called Professor Marvel, and that big hot-aired balloon was owned by him. He greets Dorothy with his magical words. Sim, Sim, Salabim, if my words are worthy, you are the little girl Dorothy. Dorothy was curious to know how he knew her name. But suddenly, she saw a big twister coming towards them. So she picked Toto and ran towards Cellar as fast as she could. When she got back, it was too late. She ran into the house, but when the twister came, she fell and hit her head. The wind lifted the whole house with Dorothy and Toto inside it, high up in the air. After some time, the house landed down on the ground. Dorothy steps out and finds that she was in a very different place. The place was much more colorful and beautiful than Lawrence. Soon Glinda, the kind witch of the North, appeared and welcomed her. Welcome, Dorothy, to the Land of Oz. I am the witch from the North. Oh, my, my, I came here? As I remember, there was a tornado and then, then, and then you came here, my dear Dorothy. That tornado was the portal to enter in the Land of Oz, and I am so grateful to you for having killed the Wicked Witch of the East. You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway. And that is the same thing. See? Glinda pointing out to the corner of the house. There are her two feet still sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy could hardly believe and cried out of fright. The sister of the Wicked Witch also saw what all happened, and soon she too reached the site. She was flying above on her broomstick and was very angry with Dorothy for killing her sister. You little rat! How dare you kill my sister? Even you dare to wear my sister's ruby slippers, which belong to me now. I will not spare you. Dorothy had no idea how the ruby slippers came to be on her own feet, but they wouldn't come off as she tried several times to remove them. And then suddenly, Wicked Witch of West cast a spell on Dorothy, but it overturns on herself and she gets caught on fire. Cursing her, she said, You little rat, soon I will come back and show you my fury. The witch flew away saying this, and now Dorothy had made a sworn enemy. Dorothy got scared and said, Glinda, what do I do now? She will definitely come back for me. <laughs> oh dear. Don't worry. Now, you go back to Lawrence as early as possible. But I don't know how to get back home. You must go to the Emerald City. The Great Wizard of Oz lives there. Ask him to help you. How do I get to the Emerald City? Is it a long way? Will you come with me? You must follow the Yellow Brick Road. It is a long way. And those ruby slippers will protect you. No one will hurt you until you wear those slippers. Soon, Dorothy and Toto found the yellow brick road, and they walked along with it. After walking for several miles, Dorothy sat down to rest. There was a big cornfield by the side of the road. In the middle of the field was a scarecrow. It was fixed onto a pole. Dorothy looked at the scarecrow and smiled. We have scarecrows in Lawrence, too. 
That's right! Dorothy looked at the Scarecrow in surprise. But our Scarecrows and Lawrence don't talk! I don't talk much. The crows are not scared of me. They have brains, and I don't. Oh dear, perhaps I can help you. She stood up and lifted the Scarecrow down from the pole. Oh, that's better. I can move my legs now. What's your name? Where are you going? My name is Dorothy. I'm going to the Emerald City to see the Great Wizard of Oz. I have heard only he can get me back to my home in Lawrence. Hmm, never heard that name before, but then I don't have any brain to remember. Do you think that Oz would give me some brains? Why don't you come with me and ask him? Thank you. Indeed, it is a good idea. So they set off together. A little further, they came upon a man made of tin. Where are you going? We are going to the Emerald City to see the Great Oz, in the hope that he will give us what we want. Oh, I have no heart. Could Oz give me a heart? Why don't you come with us and find out? Thank you. I surely will join you. So they all left, following the yellow brick road. The road was passing through a dense forest. The forest was getting darker and spookier. Ruff, ruff. Looking at the moving bush, Toto started to bark at it. And all of a sudden, a big muscular lion appeared from behind the bush. They all were scared and shivering. But she was surprised to see that the lion burst into tears and was crying loud. Hey, first you came from nowhere and scared us, and now you are crying? <laughs> what a strange lion you are. <laughs> I am a coward, and I'm afraid of everything. When I roar, my heart beats very fast because I have no courage. At least you have a heart. And you have brains, too. Toto and I want to go home to Lawrence. I am going to ask Oz to help us get back there. Do you think that Oz can give me courage? Then I wouldn't be a coward anymore. It seems that the wizard is very powerful. You are welcome to come with us and ask him. They all reached the Emerald City. It was a wonderful place where everything was green. The wizard was known to everyone in the city, but no one had seen him personally. They all reached a castle. The castle dome was similar to the hot air balloon that she saw during the storm. Wondering, when she tried to enter the gates, she was stopped by the royal guards. You are entering the Emerald City Castle. How may I help you? We have come to see the Great Wizard of Oz. We've come such a long way, not to waste his time. Then I will ask permission to the wizard. You should all wait here. Eventually, the wizard agreed to meet them. As soon as they entered in royal court, they saw a hologram image of his face on the throne. It was huge and appeared to be very frightening. Sim Sim Salabim. Hello, Dorothy, a child from Lawrence, which I knew. Tell me, dear, what can I do to please you? I know this voice, but from where? Oh, Wizard of Oz, we humbly ask you for your help. Oh, little Dorothy. I will help you, sure. Grab the Wicked Witch's broomstick, and I won't let you endure. Off they went, a little daunted by their task, towards the witch's castle. The Wicked Witch wanted Dorothy's ruby slippers because she knew they had great power. As soon as they reach the witch's castle, she greets them, saying, Hello again, you little rat. Finally, we meet again to your end. Now, give me those ruby slippers, or I will kill you. <laughs> no one will go anywhere from here, and I am going to kill you all. She had a plan of her own to destroy them, one by one. She shoots out the fire at them from her broomstick. Dorothy tries to protect herself from that fire. Her slippers glow, and a gush of water comes out of her hand. The fire fizzles off, 
The wicked witch gets angrier. As she raises her wand to cast a spell upon them, Toto runs and grabs her broomstick for Dorothy. The slippers glow again, and Dorothy shoots fire directly at the witch, burning and melting her in her own castle. Dorothy took the broomstick of the wicked witch to the wizard. On seeing that they have completed his task, the wizard reveals his true self to them. He was Professor Marvel. Professor Marvel agreed to take Dorothy back to her home in Lawrence. He issued a diploma to the Scarecrow, a bravery medal to the Lion, and a heart-shaped watch to the Tin Man. They all were happy. Glinda, too, appears in front of them. You have helped everyone in the Land of Oz. So, these ruby slippers belong to you now. You can now take them off any time you want. And if you need me any time in the future, just knock the shoes together three times and I will be there for you. Dorothy said goodbye to her friends. Professor Marvel, Dorothy, and Toto take off in the hot air balloon, waving them from above. Before she knew it, she was in her own bed in Lawrence. Aunt Em and Uncle Henry were trying to wake her up. Dorothy wakes up with the long yawn. She tries to tell them about the amazing adventures she's had, but to them, it was all just her dream. As she pulls her blanket off and notices the sparkling red ruby slippers beside her leg. The End Thumbelina There once was a woman who wanted so very much to have a tiny little child, but she did not know where to find one. So she went to an old good witch, and she said, I have set my heart upon having a tiny little child. Please, could you tell me where I can find one? That's easily done. Here's a grain of barley for you. Put it in a flower pot, and you'll see what you shall see. Oh, thank you. She planted the barley seed as soon as she got home. It quickly grew into a fine, large flower, which looked very much like a tulip. But the petals were folded tight, as though it was still a bud. This is such a pretty flower. The woman kissed its lovely red and yellow petals. And just as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud pop and flew open. In the middle of it sat a tiny girl. She was sweet and fair to see, but she was no taller than a human thumb. Such a pretty child. From now on, I will call you Thumbelina. A nicely polished walnut shell served as her cradle. That was how she slept at night. In the daytime, she played on a table where the woman put a plate surrounded with a wreath of flowers on which there floated a large tulip petal. Thumbelina used the petal as a boat, and with a pair of white horsehairs for oars, she could row clear across the plate. She could sing, too. Her voice was the softest and sweetest that anyone ever has heard. One night, as she lay in her cradle, a horrible toad hopped in through the window, right down on the table where Thumbelina was asleep under the red rose petal. Here's a perfect wife for my son. She seized upon the walnut shell in which Thumbelina lay asleep and hopped off with it, the window and into the garden. The toad lived with her son. He was just like his mother, but slimy and more horrible. Don't speak so loud or you'll wake her up. She might get away from us yet. We must put her on one of the broad water lilies out in the stream. She is so small and light that it will be just like an island to her. Many water lilies with broad green leaves grew in the stream. The leaf which lay furthest from the bank was the largest of them all. And it was to this leaf that the old toad swam with the walnut shell, which held Thumbelina. The poor little Thumbelina woke up early the next morning. And when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly. There was water all around the big green leaf, and there was no way at all for her to reach the shore. Thumbelina sat down and cried. 
the little fishes who swam in the water beneath her, up popped their heads to have a look at the little girl. No sooner had they seen her than they felt very sorry. They gathered around the green stem, which held the leaf where she was, and nodded in two with their teeth. Away went the leaf down the stream, and away went Thumbelina, far away from where the toad could not catch her. Near the edge of the woods, where she now had arrived, was a large grain field. But the grain had been harvested long ago. Only the dry, bare stubble stuck out of the frozen ground. It was just as if she were lost in a vast forest. Then she came to the door of a field mouse who had a little whole stubble. There this mouse lived, warm and cozy, with a whole storeroom of grain. Poor Thumbelina stood at the door just like a beggar and pled for a little bit of barley because she was hungry like anything. Oh, you poor little thing. You must come into my warm room and share my dinner. But you must keep my room tidy and tell me stories, for I am very fond of them. Thumbelina did as the kind old field mouse asked, and she had a very good time of it. Few days passed, and one day, the field mouse came to Thumbelina. Soon we shall have a visitor. Once every week my neighbor comes to see me, and he's even better off than I am. If you could only get him for a husband, you would be well taken care of. But he can't see anything. You must tell him the very best stories you know. Thumbelina did not like this suggestion. She would not even consider the neighbor because he was a mole. He paid them a visit. The field mouse talked about how wealthy and wise he was and how his home was more than 20 times larger than hers. As Thumbelina had to sing for him, the mole fell in love with her sweet voice. But he didn't say anything about it yet. He had just dug a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and the field mouse and Thumbelina were invited to use it whenever they pleased, though he warned them not to be alarmed by the dead bird which lay in this passage. It was a complete bird with feather and beak. It must have died quite recently when winter set in, and it was buried right in the middle of the tunnel. The mole took a torch of decayed wood. In the darkness, it glimmered like fire. He went ahead of them to light the way through the long, dark passage. When they came to where the dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose to the ceiling and made a large hole through which daylight could fall. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow with his lovely wings folded at his side and his head tucked under his feathers. Thumbelina felt so sorry for him, but the mole gave the body a kick with his short stumps and said, Thank goodness none of my children can be a bird. What good is all his chirp chirping when he starves and freezes to death? Thumbelina kept silent. But when the others turned their back on the bird, she bent over, smoothed aside the feathers that hid the bird's head, and kissed his closed eyes. Maybe it was he who sang so sweetly to me in the summertime. What pleasure he gave me, the dear pretty bird. That night, Thumbelina could not sleep a wink, so she got up and wove a fine large coverlet set of a bedsheet out of hay, grass that has been dried. She took it to the dead bird and spread it over him so that he would lie warm in the cold earth. Goodbye, you pretty little bird, and thank you for your sweet songs last summer when the trees were all green and the sun shone so warmly upon us. She laid her head on his breast and it started her to feel a soft thump as if something were beating inside. This was the bird's heart. He was not dead. He was only numb with cold. And now that he had been warmed, he came to life again. Thank you, pretty child. I have been wonderfully warmed. 
Come on, my dears. You could sit on my back as we can fly away through the green woods. Now that the cold winter is coming, I shall fly far, far away to my home. Won't you come along with me? You can ride on my back. Yes, I will go with you. She sat on his back. Then the swallow soared into the air, over forests and over lakes. At length, they reached Swallow's home. There, the sun shone far more brightly than it ever does, and the sky seemed twice as high. This is my home. If you will choose one of those glorious flowers and bloom down below, I shall place you in it, and you will have all that your heart desires. That will be lovely. Down below was a beautiful garden with lovely white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbelina and put her on one of the large petals. How surprised she was to find in the center of the flower a little man. On his shoulders were the brightest shining wings. He was the fairy of the flower. But when he saw Thumbelina, he rejoiced, for she was the prettiest little girl he had ever laid eyes on. So he took off his golden crown and put it on her head. He asked if he might know her name, and he asked her to be his wife. Yes, I will. Only if you bring my mother here, and we three will live happily here. He agreed and brought Thumbelina a present, a pair of wings. Everyone rejoiced. Soon, Thumbelina Mother joins them. Oh, Thumbelina, you don't know how happy I am to get you back. And they all lived happily ever after. The End Pinocchio Long, long ago, there lived an old toy maker named Geppetto. When he worked, Geppetto felt happy. When he took rest, a sad feeling came over him. Ah, uh, all my life, and I have no child to call my own. One day, Geppetto carved a puppet from wood in the shape of a boy. While putting him in the cupboard, he said, I will call you Pinocchio. That night, from out of the window, a big star twinkled brightly. Geppetto looked out the window to the twinkling star and made an impossible wish. If I could make one wish, it would be that I would have a real boy of my own. That night, the same big star swooshed right into Geppetto's room. It changed into a blue fairy. The blue fairy flew over to the bed and said to sleeping Geppetto, Wise Geppetto, you gave everyone happiness by creating beautiful toys and clocks. Now it's my turn to fulfill your wish. Then she turned to Pinocchio and said, Little wood puppet, you will be able to walk and talk like a real boy. She tapped the puppet one time with her wand. And if you can prove that you are brave and true, someday you will be a real boy. Pinocchio's eyes opened, and with another spell of the fairy, a cricket appeared. Meet Mr. Jiminy Cricket. He will be your conscience. He will stay with you to help you make wise choices. And with that, the blue fairy went swoosh and was gone. When Geppetto woke up the next morning, he said, I will go take my Pinocchio out of the cupboard to finish up some final touches. But the cupboard was empty. Geppetto was worried, and he began to search the whole house. Suddenly, a voice came from the other side of the room. <laughs> Papa! Here I am, Papa! What? You can talk? Yep! I am Pinocchio, your boy! How can this be? 
he rushed over and swept the wooden puppet into his arms. Pinocchio, my son! He said in great happiness. One day, Pinocchio saw some boys going to school, and he said to Geppetto, I want to go to school like other boys. Later that day, Geppetto came back home with school books. Now you can go to school. The next morning, Pinocchio said goodbye to Geppetto. He skipped along the path to school, humming as he went. The cricket rode on his shoulder, happy too. Coming up to them on the path was a greedy fox and a dumb cat. What a lovely boy you are. And where are you going on this fine day? I'm going to school. You should come with us to the fair. He put his arm around Pinocchio's shoulder. Listen to me. Anything you need to know, you can learn at the fair. Really? I will write it down on bond and you can take it from me. Yeah, you should take it from him. <laughs> Shut up, you moron. Don't mind him, Pinocchio. Let's go to the fair and you can see for yourself. Then Jiminy said, Pinocchio, he does not know what he is talking about. The fox flicked his finger and tossed Jiminy Cricket away. Pinocchio, don't listen to him. Okay, let's go to the fair. And off they went. No, Pinocchio, stop! But Pinocchio, the fox, and the cat did not hear him. They were already inside the fair. On stage, a puppet show was running in full swing. I am a puppet too. I can dance like that. Pinocchio jumped right onto the stage and started to dance with the other puppets. Suddenly, the crowd started to cheer. Look at that puppet. It has no strings. No strings? Amazing. Everyone laughed and laughed. They threw coins on the stage. A man named Stromboli, who ran the fair, saw coins flying onto the stage. He was a gypsy and a cruel man who was very greedy. <laughs> well now, rubbing his chin, this puppet with no strings will make me rich. The next thing Pinocchio knew, he was picked up and thrown into a cage. Hey, get me out or I will call my papa. He will teach you a lesson. <laughs> you think I'm a fool? Ha <laughs> boy, scream as loud as you want. I'll never let you go. I was waiting for this day to come. Only you can make me the richest person in the world. <laughs> After Stromboli left, Pinocchio shouted for help. No one else but Jiminy Cricket heard Pinocchio's calls. I'm stuck. How did this happen to me? <laughs> this is because you were ignorant to me. Now try not to cry. I'm here with you. We'll find some way out of this. All of a sudden, poof, there was the blue fairy. Please, can you help me? Tell me first, how did you get inside that cage? He decides to lie to the fairy about the incident and then says, Um, I was robbed. Is that right? She said with a frown. Pinocchio's nose began to grow. Yes, robbed by two men. No, four. The nose grew more. They took my books. They made me come here and they threw me into this cage. His nose grew longer and longer until Pinocchio could see nothing in front of his face but one big giant nose and birds nesting on it. Why is my nose so big? Pinocchio, you must know what the truth really is. I guess so. I wanted to come to the fair. I came here with a fox and a cat. The nose grew shorter and the nest fell off. Then someone put me in this cage. The nose was back to normal. Well done. Now I will get you out of here. 
With a wave of her wand, Pinocchio was out of the cage. Here are your books. Know this. You are on your own from now on. Make sure you do the right thing next time. After this conversation, the blue fairy vanished. Pinocchio was back on the road to school. A coachman with a beautiful white horse drove up. He had an astonishing buggy which advertised Pleasure Island on it. Hey, kid, how about a ride? No, thank you. I am going to school. <laughs> He'll ride a lot faster with me. All right. I want to get to school right away. When Pinocchio was inside the coach, the coachman said, "Say, kid, why do you think boys like to go to school? To learn things and to grow up, I guess, so we can do what we want." <laughs> well, what if I told you you could do what you wanted right now? Right now? Yeah, think about it. Skip the books. Skip the school. Right now, how would you like to have all the candy you can eat? All the candy? Yeah, ice cream, candy of every flavor. All this and more at Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island. Best place in the world for boys like you. Don't listen to him, Pinocchio. Why wait? I know just where Pleasure Island is. This is your lucky day, kid. So what do you say? Let's go there. I'm going to Pleasure Island. Uh, here we go again. After a while, the coach stopped. As Pinocchio looked around, he got excited. For everything the coachman had told him was true. Heaps of candy all over. Tubs of ice cream in every flavor. Boys like him could eat and eat and play all day. None of them had to work or clean up. But after a few days, something was odd. So he asked Jiminy Cricket, "Where did all the boys go? All I see now are donkeys. I must say there used to be more boys around here." Just then, one of his ears turned into a donkey ear. Then his other ear popped into a donkey ear too. Oh my! What is happening to you? I don't know. Hee haw! Hee haw! Oh no! Now I get it. Boys get turned into donkeys here. Then the donkeys are sold. Pinocchio, we have to get you out of here fast while we still can. Let's go! Hee haw! Hee haw! Run quick! They ran out of Pleasure Island. Soon, they were at a dock by the ocean. Pinocchio called out to a man by the dock, "Please, sir, I'm looking for an old man named Geppetto. Do you know him?" Hee haw, hee haw. Oh, oh yes, that's the old man whose son left one morning and never came back. The old man went out on a boat to look for him, and no one has seen the poor fellow since. Oh no. This is entirely my fault. Hee haw! Hee haw! <laughs> I must look for my father. I will find you, father. Pinocchio jumped off the dock into the ocean. The cricket jumped in too, close behind. Most of Pinocchio was still made of wood, so he could float on the ocean. Until something was rushing up towards him, something big and very fast. In a moment, a giant whale was upon them. It opened its giant jaws and, with one gulp, swallowed Pinocchio. They were in the dark belly of the whale. Are you okay? said Pinocchio to the cricket. I'm fine. Wait a minute, father. Is that you, father? Father, it's me, Pinocchio. Pinocchio, my son. I I thought I was dreaming. They hugged in joy. Pinocchio was sorry for leaving him alone, and Geppetto was happy to find Pinocchio back. I am so sorry, father. I have realized my mistakes and will never leave you alone again. We must get out of here. I have an idea. Let's make a fire that will get us all out of here. They gathered driftwood, which was mistakenly swallowed by the whale. And they got a fire going. This is how we can make the whale sneeze. Pinocchio waved his arms over the flame to make a lot of smoke. Soon, 
clouds of black smoke were rising up. The whale gave a cough, and then, a shoo! In one big sneeze, Pinocchio, Geppetto, and Jiminy Cricket flew out of the huge whale's hole. Rolling over and over above the seawater at last, they landed on the shore. Then, in a flash, the blue fairy appeared in front of them. Pinocchio, you saved your father. You made the right choices by listening to your conscience and proved that you are both brave and true. And now, you will be a real boy. Blue Fairy tapped Pinocchio's head with her wand. Pinocchio looked at his soft arms and soft legs. The Blue Fairy turned to the cricket and said his work is finished here. In a flash, the two of them were gone. And Pinocchio and Geppetto lived happily ever after. The End The Ant and the Grasshopper Once upon a time, there lived ants and a grasshopper in a grassy meadow. All day long, the ants would work hard, collecting grains of wheat from the farmer's field far away. They used to work in much disciplined manner. They would hurry to the field every morning as soon as it was light enough to see by and toil back with heavy grains of wheat balanced on their head. They would put the grains of wheat carefully away in their larderland and then hurry back to the field for more. On the other hand, the grasshopper was lazy and would rest all day in the shade, singing songs to himself and eating tasty treats. He would enjoy his life to the fullest and hardly cared what comes next. He always used to pity the poor ants, who worked hard all day. Days went by, and Grasshopper hopped around lazily in the grass, warm, happy, and well-fed, and chirping and singing to himself because life was good. While ants were carrying grains and taking them to their nest with the great toil. One day, when the ants were carrying the grains, one of the ants fell down due to the heavy weight of the grain. He was tired and hurt. Instead of helping the ant, Grasshopper looked at him and laughed. The ant asked, Mr. Grasshopper, will you please help me with lifting this grain till my nest? I will be really thankful to you. But the grasshopper ignored him and continued playing his music. With many efforts, the ant alone lifted the grain. <sighs> Why do you work so hard, dear ant? said the grasshopper. Come, rest a while, listen to my song. Summer is here and the days are long and bright. Why waste the sunshine in labor and toil? The ant would ignore him and head bent would just hurry to the field a little faster. This would make the grasshopper laugh even louder. <laughs> what a silly little ant you are. He would call after her. Come, come and dance with me. Forget about work. Enjoy the summer. Live a little. I am helping to lay up food for the winter, said the ant, and recommend you do the same. <sighs> Why bother about winter, said the grasshopper. We've got plenty of food at present, and there's still plenty of time to prepare for winter. But the ant knew what he was doing, and went on his way, and continued his toil. As the grasshopper hopped away across the meadow, singing and dancing merrily. This continued for the rest of the days to come. Instead of working and preparing for winter, the grasshopper preferred to dance, sing, and play at his leisure. He did not realize that the wonderful summer days will not last forever, and soon cold and rainy days will be near. Summer faded into autumn, and autumn turned into winter. The sun was hardly seen, and the days were short and gray, the nights long and dark. 
It became freezing cold, and snow began to fall. The grasshopper shivered through the cold breeze. He tried to cover himself with the dry leaves around, but the strong wind even blew those away. He felt hungry and could not find anything to eat. He was sure that if he would not eat, he will soon die. He felt weak, and soon Grasshopper realized that the ant was right, and he should have been prepared. The grasshopper didn't feel like singing anymore. He was cold and hungry. He had nowhere to shelter from the snow and nothing to eat. The meadow and the farmer's field were covered in snow. There was no food to be had. Oh, what shall I do? Where shall I go? Wailed the grasshopper. He hadn't thought that this winter might be worse than usual, and because he hadn't stored food for himself or helped anyone else to do it, he would not live to see another summer. He had nowhere to shelter from the snow, and found himself dying of hunger. While he saw the ants enjoying the food stored and collected in the summer. Ah, I shall go to the ant and ask her for food. And shelter," declared the grasshopper, perking up. So he staggered to the ants' hill and knocked at their door. "Hello, ants!" he cried cheerfully. "Here I am to sing for you, as I warm myself by your fire, while you get me some f- f- food from your from that larder of yours." No, no, Mr. Grasshopper. We do not wish to listen to any song of yours. He begged them to let him in and asked for something to eat, or else he would die. What? cried the ants in surprise. Haven't you stored anything away for the winter? What in the world were you doing all last summer? I, 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 I didn't, I didn't have time to store any food. Complained the grasshopper. I was just so busy playing the music that、uh, before I knew, the summer was gone. The ants shook their heads in disgust, turned their backs on the grasshopper, and went on with their work. The ant who once asked the grasshopper to help him looked at him and said, "All summer long, I worked hard while you made fun of me and sang and danced. You should have thought of winter then." Find somewhere else to sing, Grasshopper. There is no warmth or food for you here. And the ant shut the door in the grasshopper's face. The grasshopper could do nothing but cry. <laughs> the end. The princess and the frog. Long, long ago. There was a big kingdom. A brave and honest king ruled there. He had a beautiful daughter. The princess was very fond of playing with the ball, so the king gifted her a ball made of gold on her birthday. She loved that ball so much that she always kept the ball with her, even when she went out of the palace. One summer in the evening. The princess was out for a stroll in a park. She held in her hand the golden ball. She was tossing the ball up in the air as high as she could, and waited for it to fall on the ground. But she threw the ball so high that the princess didn't see where the ball had gone. She just heard a heavy splash coming from a nearby lake. Oh no! I can't believe I lost my golden ball," wept the princess in despair. <laughs> How am I going to tell my father that I lost the precious gift he gave me? Saying this, princess started crying. <laughs> I would give anything to be able to get it back. Suddenly, a frog jumped out and sat over a leaf in the lake. 
What makes you cry, dear princess? The princess overheard the voice. She looked up, but did not see anyone around. May I be of any help to you, princess? She heard this same croaking voice again. Then she saw a frog sitting over a leaf at the edge of the lake. My princess, would you like me to come help you get the ball out of the lake? The frog asked her kindly. Yes, yes, that would be lovely, clapped the princess happily. I will give you as many gems and diamonds, as many as you ask for. But the frog shook his head. Uh-uh. I don't want your gems or diamonds. I don't want any of your treasure. It's of no use to me. What I ask of you is love me and let me live with you and eat from your plate and sleep in your bed with you. If you can agree, I can perhaps bring back your golden ball. What a terrible idea! How can a frog live like a human being? thought the princess. I doubt the nasty frog will ever be able to find my ball. And even if he did, he wouldn't be able to come to visit me to my castle. It is too far for him. So she replied, Yes, yes, sure, it is a promise. Whatever you say, I agree to it. Just bring me my ball and I will grant your wishes. The princess begged. The frog then dived into the lake with a splash. The princess waited eagerly with her eyes glued to the lake. Soon, the frog's head popped out. Here you are, my princess, your ball, he said, and coming out of the lake, he rolled the golden ball towards her. She took her favorite plaything and ran towards the castle, overjoyed. She forgot what she had promised the frog and left him shouting and calling after her. Wait, princess, wait. Have you forgotten your promise? Please take me with you. But she never turned back. The next day, the princess was sitting with her family at the dinner table when someone knocked gently on the door. The princess ran to the door and was surprised to see that it was the frog from the lake who had somehow succeeded to reach the castle on his own. The princess shut the door immediately and sat back on his table. Who was it that upset you so much, my darling? Her father asked. Oh, father, said the princess, not knowing how to explain what happened at the lake. Yesterday, I was playing with the gold ball that you gifted me on my birthday. I dropped it in the lake. There was a frog sitting on a leaf, and the frog offered to help me get it out of the lake from the bottom. In return, I had to promise that he could live with me here. The king thought for a while, and then he said, You are a princess, and a princess should never give empty promises. Stick to your words and let him in. The princess went to open the door, and the frog jumped and said in his croaking sound, Please take me to the dinner table so that I can eat. The princess looked at her father and reluctantly picked up the frog and brought him to the table and placed him on the table. She wiped her hand in disgust. The frog started to eat from her gold plate and started making nasty tapping and splashing sound. After dinner, the frog spoke again. I am so tired now. Take me to your bedroom and put me in your bed. I want to rest for some time. The princess cursed herself. How long can I live like this? Will I ever get rid of this dirty thing? The princess took him to her chamber and left him on a pillow next to hers. The frog slept next to the princess as she had promised, and in the morning he hopped down and went out of the castle. Phew! sighed the princess when she woke up and saw that the frog was gone. He won't bother me again now that I have granted him his wish. But she was wrong, because the frog came back in the evening. She was already in bed when she heard the same gentle knock on the door. The next morning, 
the princess woke up and saw that the frog was gone again. But the evening came, and frog knocked on the door for the third time. The princess felt disgusted by sleeping with frog every day, and she started to think of a way to get rid of him. With plans running through her mind, she fell asleep. When she woke up in the morning, the frog was gone, and a handsome prince was looking at her with his beautiful brown eyes. She was pleasantly shocked, but she couldn't understand what had happened overnight. The prince told her the story of the curse that had been put on him. He further said, I was a prince and lived in the castle just like you. But then, one day, a spiteful witch put a spell on me. I had to find the princess who would let me live with her for three days to break this spell. I am so happy that you were the princess who got me out of my misery. The princess was so happy to have this wonderful, handsome prince in his life. They both soon got married and lived happily in the prince's father castle. The End The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said, and with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, Stop, pot, stop. <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return, but if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, what use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. 
The steam rose, and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> Yummy. that she could mm. not resist the creamy mm. porridge, mm. Oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy Ta -ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the later. new one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, pot, cook, she commanded. And presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty, Pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End The Three Little Piglets Once upon a time, there were three little piglet brothers named Jimmy, oink, oink, Timmy, oink, 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 and Tommy. Oink, oink. The three brothers lived in a very small, creaky and leaky old shack. One night, when the piglets were sleeping, the old creaky ceiling cracked, and their shack came down falling apart. The piglets had no place to stay safe anymore from the big, bad, cunning wolf. That's it. We should have our own houses, which will not fall apart, said Jimmy. The three little pigs decided that they would build new and stronger houses of their own. Tommy loved trees and flowers, so he decided to build the house with the straw, sticks, leaves, and petals. 
Timmy loved sweets, so he decided to build the house with chocolates, candies, and pastries. Jimmy was smarter, and so he decided to build his house stronger with construction material like bricks and cement. They all lived happily in their own houses, but one night, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Tommy's house and knocked on his door. Little pig, little pig, let me in, said the wolf. Tommy was sure that the big bad wolf had come to gobble him up. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin, he said from the other side of the door. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, said the wolf angrily. The house of sticks and straw was not strong enough. The big bad wolf then huffed and then puffed and blew the house down. Tommy could not save his house, so he ran and ran until he finally arrived at Timmy's candy house. He went in and closed the door behind him. The big bad wolf blew away my house and he wants to gobble me up, cried Tommy, catching his breath. Don't worry, he won't be able to get us here in my house, said Timmy. Soon, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Timmy's house and knocked on the door. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in, said the big bad wolf, wicking his lips. Not by the hair on our chin chin chins, said the piglets. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in, <laughs> said the wolf angrily. The piglets were scared and were shivering. <laughs> the house of sweets was not strong enough. The big bad wolf then huffed and then puffed and blew the house down. Timmy and Tommy could not save their house, so they ran and ran <laughs> until they reached Jimmy's brick house. They went in and closed the door behind them. The, the big, big bad wolf blew away our houses and he, and he wants, wants to gobble us, us up, cried Timmy and Tommy, <laughs> catching their breath. Don't worry, he won't be able to get us here in my house, said Jimmy confidently. Outside, the big bad wolf came creeping up to Jimmy's house and knocked on the door. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in, said the big bad hungry wolf, licking his lips. Not, Not like the hair on our chinny chin chins, said the piglets. Then I'll huff and I'll puff. And I'll blow your house in, <laughs> said the wolf angrily. The brick house of Jimmy was strong enough to keep the wolf away. The big bad wolf then huffed and then puffed and tried to blow away the house. But the house of bricks was too strong for him. He couldn't blow the house down. You bad wolf, you cannot gobble us up, said Jimmy proudly. Gobble you up? But I didn't want to eat you. I just needed a place to stay, said the wolf cunningly. I could never build such a beautiful house as you have, he further added. Go away, you bad wolf. We've heard a lot about you. Don't try to fool us, said Jimmy. Hearing this, the wolf got even angrier and started to think about the plan to get inside the house. Timmy and Tommy were very scared and started to shiver again. Oh, oh no, he will come and get us. Tommy said. Jimmy calmed them and said, Don't worry, I have a plan. 
so, he immediately lit up the fireplace and kept the big vessel with water in it to boil. The wolf outside climbed up the house and said, Little piglets, little piglets, I'm coming into the chimney and I will gobble you up. The wolf began to climb down through the chimney. But just as the big bad wolf was climbing down, Jimmy took off the lid and, uh uh-oh, splash. The wolf fell straight into the boiling water. (laughs) Quickly, Jimmy put the lid back on the vessel and that was the end of the big bad wolf. Jimmy was too clever for the wolf. The three brothers laughed and cheered. (laughs) Sorry, I snorted when I laughed. (laughs) (laughs) The little piglets lived happily ever after in the house made of bricks. The End The Emperor's New Clothes Many years ago, there lived an emperor who loved fancy clothes so much that he spent all his money on elegant suits and cloaks. He took no interest in his army or the theatre or in driving through the country unless it was to show off his new clothes. One day, two swindlers arrived in the city. They told everyone that they were weavers and could weave the very finest materials imaginable. Not only were the colors and designs unusually attractive, but the clothes made from these materials were so fine that they were invisible to anyone who wasn't terrifically smart and fit for his job. The emperor thought, Well, they must be wonderful clothes indeed. If I wore them, I could see which one of my statesmen were unfit for their jobs and also be able to tell the clever ones from the stupid. And he paid a large sum of money to the swindlers to make them start work. The swindlers then made a great fuss about setting up their workshop. They put up looms and pretended to be weaving, but there was no thread on the looms. They demanded the richest silks and finest gold thread, which they promptly hid in their own bags, and then they went on walking far into the night at the empty looms. I wonder how they're getting on, the emperor thought again, and then he became rather nervous. He was a bit worried at the idea that a man who was stupid or unfit for his job would not be able to see what was woven. Not that he thought he was no good, oh no, but all the same, he would feel happier if someone else had a look at the stuff first. I'll send my honest old Prime Minister to the weavers, he thought. So off went the honest old Prime Minister to the weavers workshop, where they were sitting at the empty looms. Good gracious me! <laughs> Why, why, I can't see a thing. But he was careful not to say so. Good Lord, is it possible that I'm stupid? (coughs) I must on no account admit that I can't see the material. One of the weavers asked, Well, what do you think of our work? Oh, it's it's charming. It's exquisite. <laughs> what what a pattern and what coloring. I shall certainly praise it to the emperor. <laughs> the old minister listened carefully as the swindlers gave details of the colors and the design and repeated it all to the emperor. The swindlers now demanded more money, more silk and more gold thread to continue the weaving. They stuffed it all into their own pockets and continued to pretend to weave on the empty frames. By and by, the emperor sent another trusted official 
to see how the weaving was going on. The same thing happened to him as to the Prime Minister. He couldn't see anything but the empty looms. I know I am not stupid. So it must be my fine job I am not fit for. I mustn't let anyone know. And so he praised the material that he couldn't see and told the emperor of its charming shades and beautiful design and weave. Then the emperor himself said he must see it and invited all his court to come with him. When they arrived at the workshop, they found the cunning swindlers weaving for all they were worth at the empty looms. Hey, look, isn't it magnificent? Oh yes, yes indeed, it's really beautiful. All the officials said, feeling sure that the others could see it. The emperor thought, What's this? I can't see anything. This is dreadful. Am I stupid? Am I not fit to be emperor? This is the most awful thing that could happen to me. Oh, oh, it's quite exquisite. He said aloud, It has our gracious approval. He nodded at the empty loom, for he wasn't going to say that he couldn't see anything. Then all the courtiers nodded and smiled at the empty loom and said, yeah. Yes, yes, yes it's, it's quite exquisite. exquisite, yes. On the eve of the grand procession, they announced, There, the emperor's new clothes are finished. Indeed, <laughs> they are. <laughs> and when morning came, the emperor went in person to the weaver's workshop. Ah, <laughs> your imperial majesty. The two weavers bowed in unison as the emperor made his entrance. You do us honor indeed. And the one poised each thumb, each finger daintily aloft as if holding up a confection really too delicate for human handling. Here, your majesty, are the breeches, he said almost in awe, while the other went through the same gesturing motions with a full sum. And here is the robe. Ah, oh, and now the mantle. You can feel they are as light as down. You can hardly tell you have anything on. Your Majesty, that's the beauty of them. <laughs> mm, yes, indeed. Will your Imperial Majesty now graciously take off your clothes? Said the swindler. Then we can fit you with the new ones. Indeed, in front of the big looking glass. So, the gentleman in waiting helped the Emperor out of the clothes he was wearing upon which the swindlers set about their pretense of dressing him in the new raiment they were supposed to have made. They took their time about it, the emperor twisting and turning this way and that the while, apparently admiring himself in the ample mirror. Gentlemen! The first one at last challenged the bemused courtiers. Perfection! Would you not say? And all the courtiers exclaimed, Goodness! How well they fit your majesty! What a cut! Wow! What colors! The master of ceremonies came in to announce, The canopy to be carried above your majesty's head is ready, and the procession is waiting. Tell them I am ready, said the emperor. Then he turned around once more in front of the glass, to make quite sure that everyone thought he was looking at his fine clothes. The emperor marched off in the procession under the grand canopy and everyone in the streets and at their windows said, Good gracious, look at the emperor's new clothes. Oh, they are the finest he's ever had. The emperor's new clothes were praised by everyone. But, but he hasn't got anything on, exclaimed a little child. Hey, what are you saying? cried the father. The people around him had heard, however, and repeated the child's words in a whisper. And then someone said them a bit louder. He hasn't got anything on. There is a little child over there saying he hasn't got anything on. That's right, that's right. He, he hasn't, hasn't got, got anything on. 
shouted at last and the emperor began to feel very uncomfortable and embarrassed for it seemed to him that the people were right but his royal upbringing prevented him from running away and he thought to himself i must go through with it now procession and all and he drew himself up haughtily while the chamberlains tripped after him bearing the train that wasn't there Three brave soldiers. They had fought so many battles for their kingdom and had won victory. But after battle, the king didn't give them any awards and threw them out of the kingdom for no reason at all. Those soldiers had to roam for a very long time to find a place to stay. And finally, they reached a jungle. The jungle was too dark to see anything. All three of them decided that one by one, all of them would guard the other two. Then, two soldiers went to sleep, and one of them collected some wood to start a bonfire. He was about to stir, and suddenly, a dwarf came out of the fire and stood right in front of him. He was wearing a red jacket. and his head was covered with a red scarf he asked the soldier who are you i am a poor soldier please sit with me i would love to talk to you and then the soldier told him his story the dwarf felt very bad for him listening to his story the dwarf said not to worry have this coat it can cover you from top to bottom that coat was not so clean so the soldier smiled but the dwarf whispered something in the soldier's ear and the soldier just kept looking at the coat stunned he turned back to thank the dwarf but by that time the dwarf was already gone it was already morning and then the soldier told his friends the story of the strange little dwarf and showed him the coat They both reacted and said the coat was so dirty and very strange. But the first soldier said it very proudly to his friends that this was not an ordinary coat. If I wear this, all my wishes will come true. Both of the soldiers were astonished. The other soldier also shared his encounter. when he was guarding them that he also met a dwarf who gifted him with a magical wallet this wallet has so many gold coins that it doesn't matter how much you spend it will never be empty then the third soldier also told his story he showed them a musical instrument this instrument is so magical that anyone listening to it will get mesmerized with the music completely and they will sing and dance to the music they were very happy to get these amazing gifts from the dwarf then the first soldier thought these should be tested so he wore the coat and asked for his wishes on my dear coat We don't have a place to live. Please get us a big and beautiful palace. And then there was a thunderstorm, a huge noise. And suddenly there was a big palace in front of them. There was a beautiful garden. And on the gate, four to five beautiful horses with a golden chariot. All three of them sat on the chariot and stared at the nearby kingdom. And suddenly, they found something. Their chariot parked right in front of a king's palace. The king was informed about their arrival and welcomed them happily. The men were so charming that the king asked them to stay in the palace for a couple of days. The king thought they were definitely prince of some distant kingdom and that maybe he could get his daughter married to one of them. One fine evening, one of the soldiers was walking in the garden with the princess, and suddenly she noticed the wallet and very happily asked, "Where did he get the wallet from?" He didn't hide anything from her and told her the story 
of how the dwarf gave it to him one night. He was very unwise to tell her this story, because the next day the princess mixed some sleeping pills in his drink, and once he was sleeping, she replaced his wallet with a wallet that was not magical. After some days, he realized the princess had cheated him and had stolen his wallet. All three of them got very angry. The soldier with the coat said she should be taught a lesson. He wore the coat and said, "Oh, my magical coat! Please take me to the princess's palace." There, the princess was counting gold coins. When she looked up, there was the soldier in the magical coat standing in front of her. Thief! Thief! The soldier got scared. He jumped from the window, and while coming down, his coat got tangled in the tree. Poor soldier! Now it was the third soldier's turn. He played his instrument and got a big army, which surrounded the whole palace. Then he sent a messenger to the king. He told him everything and asked for the coat and the wallet. But the cunning princess asked for two days' time. How many days? Two days. The princess disguised herself as a servant and went to investigate the soldiers' camp. She had a lot of things to eat with her. She went near their camp and started singing very nicely. Slowly but surely, all the soldiers came out and started listening to her. Then she asked her servant to get that instrument, and she did. And then both of them came back to the palace. She was so happy. The poor soldiers were homeless again. One of the soldiers said, "Let's get separated, and then let's see what happens." Then all three of them got separated. The soldier with the wallet walked a very long distance, and when he got tired, he sat down below a tree. It was an apple tree. He took an apple and started eating it. But he was so hungry, he plucked another one and started eating. He was about to eat a third apple too, but then he started feeling dizzy. Oh, what's happening to me? His nose was getting longer and longer, so that he couldn't see the end of his face. Since he was so dizzy, he slept. The other soldiers were also walking, and then hit something. Oh, what is this? It looks like this is someone's nose. They started walking in the direction of the nose, and when they reached the end, they were astonished. They were so sad to see the condition of their poor friend. And then suddenly, that strange little dwarf appeared in front of them. My friends, don't worry. If he will eat fruit from that tree, then his nose will come back to its previous state. And you shouldn't take this fruit to the princess. You should teach her a lesson. Now the soldier tried that apple, disguised himself as a gardener, and arrived at the princess's palace. She saw the fresh red apple, and she became very happy. She had two apples to eat right then. Once she had eaten the third apple, her nose started growing big and longer and so long that it reached the garden, and it was still growing. The king became frightened and spread the news in his kingdom: Whoever will cure my daughter, I will give them a large reward. The next day, both soldiers disguised themselves and mixed apple juice in medicine and gave it to the princess. Then, her nose started growing more and more. The next day, she was given medicine with juice from other fruit. Finally, her nose started going back to its original size. 
But then they thought of teaching the princess a lesson, so they gave her medicine with red apple juice. The princess got scared. Now her nose was getting longer and longer again. Princess, I think you have stolen someone's things. I know magic, and I can read that. If you do not return those things, then you will stay in this condition forever. But the princess was by no means ready to return things she had stolen. Okay, whatever you want. The king tried to convince her. You should return those items. Now princess has understood as well. She was so fed up of that long nose. She returned all the items she had stolen from the soldiers. Then he fed the other fruit juice to the princess. Who wore the jacket and went back to his friends, and then all three of them lived happily ever after in their palace. The end. If you enjoyed this story, please like and subscribe our channel, and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment.